Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Todd Clint's SharePoint Podcast number 319, recorded live on Monday, December 19th, 2016. Uh, I am your host and a very festive and uh, well-lit up Todd Clint. Uh, other guy, tell him who you are. And I am Shane Young. I am the one that has to put up with Todd Quint's garbage for the next 30 minutes while you guys are like, oh, I can't wish Shane would speak more. Unfortunately, I have to let Todd do some of it too, so I apologize now. So uh, I'm not, they'll probably lose track of who you are because you don't have a name tag on to let them know. <laughs> I mean, that's true for those five people who watch the actual video. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> so you can just wave to her because it's, uh, you know. Yep. But no, it should be fun, right? Uh, yes, Todd's rocking the name tag. For those of you that are not able to see it, it's a nice digital scaling going across. I bet on the YouTube stream, it probably just looks like a big old blur. But Todd is loving life right now because of the name tag on his head, like the McDonald's worker that he wants to be. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Ask me about my Happy Meal. Uh, yeah, so I don't remember where I got this. I got this a year or so ago. But yeah, you can put eight messages on it. There's a little piece of software. You can plug it in with USB. Um I've had in, inordinate amounts of uh, inappropriate fun with this thing. But it's it was like on my those, desk. Good. I didn't ask you like one of those Raspberry Pis or something. It seems like everything's a Raspberry Pi these days with you. No, but I did get it. Um, it's all about the Raspberry Pis. I did get it uh, thinking I could control it with my Raspberry Pi, but I can't. And that was why I got it, because I was thinking I could use this and hook it up to something, because it's got a USB thing on it. But you can only push programming out with USB. You can't update it live. So no so, TFTT either? Not Are that you? I know of, no. Oh, that would be a lot of fun. Let people randomly tweet, just have them come across your forehead. I'd if, sign up for that service. <laughs> if there was a way to make that happen, I would do it. I would uh, I would do it. It was pretty, pretty weak sauce. Uh, anyway, so I'm Todd. I should have put my contact information in my thing, but you can uh, hit me up on Twitter at Todd Clint. I'm on the web at ToddClint.com. You can email me, Todd.Clint at Rackspace.com. Shane, tell them how to get a hold of you in the unlikely event that they care to. Good old Twitter, at Shane's Cows. You got to moo when you do it. Uh, somebody actually mooed at me this week. It was pretty funny. Uh, so there's always Shane's Cows. There's Shane Young at BoldZebras.com. You need consulting help. You want to hire me because, let's face it, Shane is uh, ready to do functional stuff for money again and not the type of stuff that Todd wants me to do for money, but, you know, actual consulting, SharePoint, PowerShell, Azure, that type of stuff. So Not, not that kind of stuff you did in uh, in college? No, you know, college was a rough time. You know, it was it was before heroin was a thing, so crack cost a lot more. It was it was rough. I, I watched the movie for the very first time uh, this weekend, the night before. It's a Christmas movie with Seth Rogen and you know James Franco and that whole group of, of things. And in one scene, Seth Rogen's wife gives him this little box. It's like a jewelry box, but it's like a bunch of different drugs in it. And he's he's going through it. He's like, huh, cocaine. I, I haven't done cocaine in like 11 years. And she's like, I don't think anybody has. <laughs> just, nothing better than life-wrecking humor. Nothing better than uh, drug abuse humor. But, I mean, uh, you know, and it reminds me of a heroin story, but I just <laughs> when, like one of the guys, right? The, the short version without giving away any details of who it was, but we were having lunch with a customer one time, right? Big fancy Fortune 100 type of company having lunch with this guy. He's like, you know, the one thing I regret about college, like, no, you know, what, what do you regret about college? He's like, I never tried heroin. <laughs> How do you how do you respond to that? I can honestly say that's one regret I do not have, um, and not because I tried heroin, but I just don't <laughs> regret not trying heroin. Well, yeah. well, we went we went really dark places with it. It turns out so he was not uh, uh, American, and so he lost something in translation. And so he actually made he wish he had tried weed. <laughs> But he, he'd been telling people for years he wish he had tried heroin. That was like one of his, you know, icebreakers. I'm like, wow, you you got some explaining to do. Well, and the thing that's funny about that is when what the guy meant to say was, "I wish I'd done weed." Is like is like the punchline. Is like the, the, the making it better. Oh my god. Anyway, we need to move on. Oh goodness, Can't family wait to write friendly. The show. Yeah, uh, show description the, this week. Oh, the, the links, uh, the links, and these the show notes alone. Um, so, speaking of production, as of today, still caught up. I am caught up two full weeks in a row. I feel like I should put one of those signs behind me. A number of weeks uh, caught up on podcast production to previous record. You know, zero something like that. So, I feel. Uh, is that gonna, like going to make that happen? <laughs> Leave that up so I can put the video. There you go. 
Uh, so that one, a podcast, uh, I forget what that was, 157 or 152 or something tells that story uh, very well. Yeah. So now I like that. We should get a custom made sign. As soon as we get a budget, right, that says the number week. <laughs> I mean, if we're dreaming, why as well dream all the way? We need, we need the budget so we can get that sign. Oh, uh, goodness. Still caught up. And Shane, what did you do this morning? A very first for the podcast. Tell the kids what you did. Well, I put us up on Petri.com. So now there should be a link to our video. There is a great article explaining all the things that talk about in the story. And once again, because everything on the internet is true, it points out that I was right last week and you were wrong. So it's amazing. But Petri.com will have a story or a link to all this for you. Yep, Petri, P-E-T-R-I.com. Now, funny thing about that, those of you who do anything on the internet, you've heard of this company out, uh, out in uh, Mountain View, California, a company called Google. And Google is a way that people find stuff on the internet. And one of the things that turns out is humans kind of suck and people try to game Google. And so one of the things that Google does is if they see two different links that have the exact same text, they blacklist them both. And so this podcast shows up at toddclint.com and the description that I write and the description that shows up in the RSS feeds and all that all goes there. If this were to show up on Petri.com with the same text, Google would think there were shenanigans in place. And somehow, though I think it's mathematically impossible, the viewership would actually go down because Google would remove both links from its, uh, its index. So the solution to this is we have to write two descriptions. I write one for toddclint.com and I don't want to write two. So I told uh, Shane that he had to write the one for Petri. Shane took some artistic license. Um, it's like Shane's mom writes those descriptions now. <laughs> Uh, so you're going to get two different views of the podcast. You, you're going to go to Petri.com and get the Shane-specific, Shane-slanted view. And you're going to go to ToddClint.com and get a more balanced, uh, reasonable view. Uh, but I can't imagine the hilarity is going to ensue over the months with this. So, so are you like the Fox News uh, version, uh, fair and I, balanced? I am the Fox News version of our podcast description, exactly. And, and I'm exactly. random Russian website version. <laughs> you are a yeah, toss or whatever there. Yeah. All right. Are we going to talk about anything real today or is it just going to be? Uh, I, I don't know why we should, we should do that. We should do a podcast. Maybe the, maybe the last one of the mm -hmm. year, just not even open up one note and just you and I riff on each other for a half an hour. I think. Uh, and then when we get to the end, be like, oh yeah, we had topics. Well, we'll just put them out to next week. Yeah. So, sorry. Sorry, Matt Damon didn't have time for you. This, <laughs> this Poor show. Matt Damon. Yeah, yep. I mean, right, we've got 11 topics today. And I mean, and number seven's a doozy. Who can't wait oh, to get to number seven? I can, I'm only here for number seven. If we if we don't do number seven, if we were going to do number seven, I wasn't even going to show up today. That's, uh, that's, um, all right. So number one, topic number one, and this was one that I got over Twitter. And this is, uh, the, the notes say, reverse DSC. So DSC, so Shane's been doing a lot of PowerShell. Do you want to tell Shane, uh, Shane, do you want to tell the people what DSC is? Desired you state configuration? You got it. And I felt bad because that's that's a tough one. And I should have prepped you for that one. It wasn't um, in the notes. How was I it, supposed to get it? It wasn't in the notes. You, you did it. You did a good find, a good job with that. Tell the folks what uh, DSC is. All right. So that is the lovely state where you say, hey, PowerShell, I want you to make sure that this piece of technology is behaving this way, right? These are the settings. These are the things that are going on. So check that once a day, once a week, once a month. And if it's not there, do something, whether it's fix yeah. it or send me a nasty email, you know, do some type of feature. But it's kind of like um, I think of it as monitoring more than more or less. Yeah. I, uh, so, yeah. So desired state configuration, kind of the way it sounds, you, you design a desired state and you define PowerShell to do that. And then periodically, periodically it goes out and checks the current state against the desired state. And if the current state doesn't match, it configures it. And this can be with Windows, this be uh, IIS configuration. There's just a bunch of things that support that. Um, there are, I don't know if there's an official one yet, but there have been a variety of non-official, non-Microsoft SharePoint DSC projects. So the idea being you could use this PowerShell and DSC framework to configure SharePoint farms and SharePoint servers. Of course, getting all this configured, SharePoint's got a hundred knobs and levers, probably a thousand. So getting all that defined is very difficult. So uh, Nick, oh, and I've, it's been so long since I've had to pronounce his name, Sh Nick Charlebois, I believe. <clears throat> and you got to do your eyebrow thing when you say that. Um, 
Nick is a longtime podcast sufferer and all that up in Canada. He wrote a reverse DSC tool. So that doesn't unconfigure your farm, though that would be hysterical if that's what it did. One of my podcasts from a long time ago has a story about a reverse migration, which is uh, awesome. Um, but this takes, you take his reverse DSC tools, you point them at an existing farm, and it generates all the DSC information you need to use DSC to configure another farm. So it's essentially a way to clone an existing farm and then use DSC to press out copies. Pretty so, cool. Have you pretty, tried it yet? I have not, no. I'm mostly afraid. Because <laughs> you think it's going to shave your cat in the process of reverse engineering your farm? Yeah, and it, you know, it's the holiday season and I want to be good to my cats. I don't want to shave them. It's cold here in Iowa. Ooh, cold. Uh, so this would be a bad time to, to shave the cats. Uh, but I trust Nick. He's written some other stuff before. But if you're looking at using DSC and if you want to, you know, stamp out uh, dev environments or test environments or something, uh, Nick's uh, uh, blog would be a good place to go for that. And I've got the link up here. So it is nickcharlebois.com, N-I-K-C-H-A-R-L-E-B-O-I-S dot C-O-M. Bingo. <clears throat> got it. Uh, and, and if you can get through all that, you know, Nick's got a picture of himself up there. He's very handsome. It's, it's well, worth, uh, well worth all that. So go check that out. And thanks to Nick. <laughs> and thanks to somebody on Twitter for suggesting that I talk about that. Did he pay you five bucks too? No, that's a brilliant idea. Oh, why didn't See, I think of that? We need a budget for the show. You had a perfect opportunity. I mean, I would have bought the sign we needed. That could that could have been sponsored content. Son yeah. of a business. All right, the next one's all you, big fella. Yeah. So our good old friend Stefan uh, Gossner, he put out an article just kind of pointing out that in the December patches, right? So last week, last Tuesday, uh, what was that like the thirteenth? I think thirteenth. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, well December, done. <laughs> I know, math, right? December cumulative updates for SharePoint 2013 and SharePoint 2016 came out. Yay. I haven't messed with either one yet, quite frankly. But um, he did say that some of the new functionality that we got in the September – or no, in the August uh, CU for 2016 around the PS config, improved error reporting, and uh, SharePoint patching, being able to do a get SP product local commandlet, both of those functionalities from 2016 – are now in 2013 as well as of the December updates. So I thought that was a nice little note just to see that, once again, Microsoft kind of keeps investing a little bit here. It used to be we all, always thought, you know, we kind of missed the boat if we were a version behind, but they kind of keep, uh, keep spending some dollars keeping 2013 going and doing. So I thought it was worth pull, calling out. Yeah, and I am constantly impressed with the things that they're backporting into 2013. Um, so this, this is one of them, you know, a bunch of the hybrid things. They've been investing in that. So so good good on them for that. So for the patches, I just now realize that I've not published the 2013 stuff for the patches. I'll get that out tonight. But you can go to toddclint.com slash uh, SP2016 builds to get the links for the 2016, SP2013 builds for SharePoint 2013 and SP2010 builds. And I'll get you the links for all of those. Yeah. And so far, now the, the, the patches just came out six days ago. So far, SharePoint 2016, we're coming up on six months of patches. Zero regression so far. Zero regression. It's insane. Now, I do, uh, there's kind of an asterisk with that. I've had a report uh, from one person about one, I don't want to call it a regression, but kind of a regression, and I need to run that past the folks at Microsoft before I, you know, talk about it much because it might be something I don't understand. But if it is, it's a super minor thing that's very easily fixed. But, yeah, the fact, I mean, thinking of all the problems that we've had over the years that we are almost, you know, Six or seven months into patching SharePoint 2016, nothing has been broken. Now, and this still begs the question, though, you know, how many people are really using 2016 in production? Is it maybe that part of the reasoning? And is that part of the reason also that Microsoft keeps backporting features of SharePoint 2013 is that so many people are still staying there? I, I don't know. I don't have numbers. I just anecdotally, I think it's a conversation. I, I can tell you the majority of people that I talk to both at Rackspace and just at conferences and all that, the majority are on 2013. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, and that's when I was over in Europe for the SharePoint Exchange Forum in Stockholm and for uh, SharePoint Days in Slovenia, that was the case. And, and I spoke to other speakers about it. That seems to be everybody's experience that 2013 really is, uh, is wedged in pretty hard right now. 
Yeah, well, I'm hoping, you know, with Feature Pack 1 rolling back in November that maybe, you know, no one works in December, right? So December's almost over. So maybe we get I know, to January. I People start going forward with that. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, uh, it, it'll be curious. It'll be curious what it takes for people to get excited about 2016 and get it installed. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff. And I've heard Feature Pack 1's, you know, made performance improvements. You know, like you've, we've talked about, there's been new features added, new new hybrid stuff. And there's yeah. a lot of reasons to go to 2016. But at the same time, I don't know, maybe it's just time to jump off and go do that Office 365 thing. Maybe that's their, I don't know. I don't know. I, I've, I've been talking to folks about, uh, you know, customers and stuff about upgrading and hosting and all that. And that, that keeps coming up. Why, why do we do, why don't we just go to office 365? So, yeah. Speaking of office 365 topic, number three, uh, last week, the SharePoint team, I think it was, I, I follow so many different blogs. I've lose, lose track. Um, uh, and that link that I'm going to put in the, sh uh, Slack channel is a bad one. Uh, but Microsoft announced that. <laughs> so, that's awesome. So um, for those of you that aren't watching the video and aren't in Slack, when I talk about it in the, the podcast, I paste the link into Slack so those folks can follow along, you know, while I read aloud. And Slack does a little preview of the window. And as I was saying, it was the wrong link because I was reading multiple articles about it. The one that I put in Slack, the preview actually said something went wrong, uh, an error occurred. So that is awesome. We will fix that link before we go to production. But last week, uh, the Office 365 team announced that they were putting into preview a new OneDrive admin interface. And so if your Office 365 tenant is a first release tenant, we'll talk about that more in a minute, you can try this out. And what this does is this gives you a, an admin portal for OneDrive that lets you set all of your universal sharing settings and uh, you know if people can share externally, anonymous links, uh, things like that. Um, and, and one of the problems with OneDrive for business, so this is OneDrive for business and this is the Office 365 OneDrive for business, is that the reporting and the discoverability for admins has been really tough. Hopefully this interface will fix it. I, I went through and looked, there are a bunch of things that don't exist in admin.onedrive.com that do exist in portal.office.com and admin.portal.office.com. Because that's just how Microsoft goes. They roll a new version out and not everything makes it. But it is just a preview. And so hopefully as it matures, it will add all these other things. Uh, but again, the auditing and the control and all that has always been a, a soft spot or a weak spot for OneDrive. Yeah, and hopefully is it, you know, the features that you latch onto the most, remember those are always the most likely to get cut when the uh, preview is over. So don't fall in love. Don't go get a tattoo that says, I love this feature until it uh, makes it to production. Yeah. Uh, and again, you have to be in first release to sh for this to show up. If you're not sure whether you're in first release, go to your uh, you know, portal.office.com, go to your admin, your uh, Office 365 admin page on the left, go to settings, uh, organizational profile, and then you can see in there, you can be standard release, first release, or first release with uh, individuals. And so you need to have that on first release or first release with individuals for the, the new admin uh, interface to show up. Yeah, that'd be another interesting thing, right? We talk about the statistics of who's moved to what version, but I'd also love to know what percentage of businesses are running, you know, first release versus standard release and, you know, or, you know, the classic UI versus the new modern UI and that type of stuff. I'd love to see numbers. They're never going to give them to us, but just be fun to know who's doing what out there. Yeah, and I think the, when they added the first release for specific users, I think that was a great move because that way you can, you can pick and choose uh, who gets it. I mean, I know a lot of folks that are trying it because that's one of one of our laments, especially for guys like you and I that are trying to fix the stuff and consult on the stuff and teach on the stuff that, you know, there's always something new and it shows up and you're Ugh. so the, the ability to use first releases, it's kind of nice, gives us a fighting chance. Yeah, well, you know, I think the other challenge, though, with the whole different release models is I had lunch with somebody, I don't know, late last week. And so they're using Office 365 pretty extensively or SharePoint Online pretty extensively. And so, but he is in a regulated industry. And so he has to go through the software development life cycle and, you know, document it and all that stuff to meet the financial regulations, which it's funny, right? We talked about, but he said it, essentially going through the process is more important than whether or not you do it correctly. It's or, and whether or not the product works. It's you got to go through the process. Yeah. 
And so he was really struggling with, you know, going and pulling production and getting it migrated to a test tenant takes him like three to four days every single time. And, you know, so I can't even imagine for him if he introduced, you know, first release for some users in there. And so then how is his other destination tenant going to keep up? And the, 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 it seems like the dev lifecycle story for SharePoint Online still isn't um, as robust as it uh, might need to be. Uh, I would agree, uh, though its developers are suffering, so to heck with them. But I will say in Microsoft's uh, defense, that while that story is, is not good now, it's better than it's ever been, and they seem to be committed to improving it. So they seem uh, they seem to be doing a good job with that. So I, yeah. I don't know. As a guy that plinks around in Office 365 on a daily basis, you and I used to we used to poke a lot of fun at Office 365. We used to really really give it some hell, and I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> it's, it's it's gotten pretty decent. Um, so they're they're doing something right. Oh yeah, I mean they're torturing developers. So I, I'm all I'm a big fan like you, but. Uh... I, I can see where this might cause some chaos eventually that my, I might have to fix. So that's why I'm kind of getting it out there. So they, they realize that it, it's treading into admin space now. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, topic number four, big fella. That's all you. Oh, good old topic number four. So artificial intelligence, we all know it's a thing. We talked about it kind of off and on. Um, Microsoft this past week announced that they're going to start having um, the ability to let – Outlook or let Microsoft schedule your meetings for you, right? Calendar.help, I think, is the uh, the fancy URL that they've got. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited to see what it'll offer, not from the standpoint I really want Outlook scheduling meetings because, well, let's face it, I'm unemployed and don't have any meetings. <laughs> um, but one of the, the pieces of the tech I've been watching for probably about a year now is uh, x.ai, right? So x.ai... You ha if when you sign up with them, and I think they're still like in this limited preview, you know, you must beg us to get in. But with X.AI, to get a meeting scheduled, like if Todd and I were going to have a meeting, I would send a email to Todd, and I would copy in my assistant, Amy, at X.AI. And Amy would just ping pong back and forth with Todd to work through the details of when we were going to have our, our meeting. And then she would just send out a calendar invite for both of us. So she would say, you know, hey, Todd, Shane prefers to meet for coffees, you know, on 8 to 10, and he's open on Tuesday and Thursday next week. Any of those times work for you. And so using some, you know, artificial intelligence, that might be a stretch, but, you know, using some of that uh, technology, she has a conversation with you, and then I just end up with a meeting invite, which is pretty cool technology. But it sounds like Microsoft said, you know what, Amy, you waited too long to get full release, and so we're going to do the same thing. I So when I first read about this, I uh, I would love this, and I would love this. Not, and I don't remember the, all the examples that they gave, but there are so many things that show up in my inbox that have aspects of time associated to them that I wish would just automatically pop into my calendar. You know, things like um, when when I order something from Amazon and it says it's going to show up on this day, I wanted it to show up in my calendar and just be a thing in there that says this thing is showing up this day. Uh, you know, if I make a flight on Delta, I want it to automatically pop up in my calendar that I'm going to be gone that day. And I want it to automatically remind me uh, all those kind of things. So I, I applaud this this stuff because this is exactly exactly where I would love to see things go. Yeah, and it's um, and I, the, the idea that's going to cut down on some of the the pain and suffering is pretty interesting. And it's also kind of near and dear to my heart because the stuff I've been doing with the, uh, that startup, rescoper.com, right? The project management software with artificial intelligence. Um, so one of the things that the algorithm for that does is it looks at your calendar because, you know, you, you live in corporate America, right? You've got a calendar. It's set eight to five. Here's all the meetings you've got littered in there. And so when people send you invites, they just assume if you don't have something in that block, you're yeah. open. Right, and so what the project management tool does is it looks at your schedule and says, hey, you can take that lunch meeting, no problem, but if you do, you're gonna miss these other goals because it kind of puts everything in a context. And so it says, even though your calendar is open in these slots, you don't really have that much time available. And it's an interesting piece because part of that program has been working with x.ai as well so that when Amy is doing your scheduling, she can see that, yes, Todd's open tomorrow from 8 to 9, but no, Todd really isn't because Todd's got to do his TPS reports or he's going to miss that deadline and get beat over the head. So there's a, it, it's, I can see the snowball happening, right, where we're just going to wake up one day and hopefully 
all these tools are finally going to do some thinking and bring contextual you know awareness to the the situation and finally stop letting us live in meeting hell maybe yeah yeah it's uh yeah in the corporate america thing you know i had to start doing stuff like uh scheduling out lunch because you get people in different time zones and they don't know what time zone you're in and they see that hour block open and they're like hey look he's open from one to two my time well that's because i'm in central and they're in eastern and um so yeah i i welcome all this i like i like the idea i like where it's going so i'll have to check that uh that outlook stuff out better yeah, and you, you unfortunately do. They're not just letting you sign up. So you gotta you go, you put in your information, and then they'll they put you on the waiting list. Oh, um, for goodness sakes! So yeah, they're they're trying to be cool and start trying to make like it exclusive. Too. Oh yeah. goodness, I'm. I'm uh, guessing if you sign up from you know corporate uh, account number seventeen, you automatically get put on. But those of us that just the rando people, they're like, yeah, we'll put you on the list. Nah, you get nothing. So uh, number five, we've got random things. Um, do we want to come back? Uh, I like six and seven. Let's skip five. Let's do six and seven and come back to five. All right. Well, yeah, we we'll probably won't get to them, right? So, yeah, go to six. Um, so this was an interesting article, and I can't remember which one you linked in here because I saw this all over. Okay, so Business Insider. They were they were talking about how the new MacBook sales of the MacBook Pro um, – the, the MacBook Pro hasn't, you know, Microsoft announced the new ones and it really didn't have any compelling things. A lot of people were disappointed. And Business Insider and really everybody is thinking that that's been helping Surface Pro sales, that the MacBook Pro just is not exciting anymore. Yeah, all that pent up demand, right? There was so many people waiting to refresh their hardware on the new MacBook to come out. It came out, it was a bust. And more than those, a few of those people went over to the Microsoft store and said, hey, we're going to try out the, uh, the Surface this time around. And which in most malls is just across the hallway. <laughs> you know, in my mall, it's like it's probably you know ten stores apart. I mean, it's it's, it's they can't see each other. So wow, Microsoft strange. screwed up there. Somebody somebody got uh, got dinged on their annual review at Microsoft for that. Well, the Disney store was across from the Apple store, and they can't unroute Disney. So what do you do? No, you can't fight the mouse. Um, so that's that's interesting. So I've got a bunch of friends who have MacBook Pros, and we have a bunch. A bunch of the SharePoint MVP crowd has MacBook Pros, and I don't know if it's the whole you know wanting to justify their purchase thing and all that. Most of them were mostly okay with it. I mean, they would have liked newer hardware, but you know they're all rocking MacBook Pros from like 2013, and they're like, eh, it's it's good enough. It's you know everything works. I can do everything I need to. So much more th uh, thing. So many more things are going into the cloud now. So they're not running as many VMs on their laptop as we did five years ago. Um, so I, I don't know. But again, that might just be them wanting to uh, justify their purchases. But very few MacBook users that I have known have really lamented the lack of excitement in the new MacBook line. Yeah, well, I find it interesting that, you know, because like Microsoft said, services had a record month, so clearly their sales were up. But the same time, I think if I was in the market for a MacBook Pro and I was like, all right, well, that's a dud. I don't know if a Surface would have been what I would have ran to. I guess maybe because it, right? Because they, they, they almost seem like different yeah. amount different, of horsepower. Yeah, different and different use cases, honestly. And yeah. and I'm, I have not, so I, I've got a Surface Pro 2 that I still use. I got it right before the Surface Pro 3s came out, and that was when the big size change happened. The 2s were 10, the 3s were 12. So I'm like, well, I'm not, you know, I just bought this thing like six months ago. I'm not going to shell out a bunch of money for a Surface Pro 3. And then the 4s came out and I was going to do the whole like Star Trek thing where only the even ones were good. Um, and so I was going to get a 4, but then folks like you and a bunch of people I know got 4s and just had a horrible time with the 4s. So I've I've held out. It sounds like the, four, the Surface Pro 4s have gotten better, like they might be viable now. Yeah, the Surface Pro 4 has finally worked out all the kinks. It actually turns on and off finally. You know? Oh, well, that is that is nice. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they finally, you know, I think the biggest complaint about the Surface Pro 4 right now is uh, a good old Paul Theratz, right? It doesn't have a pin loop. I think that's his biggest oh, uh, complaint. Yeah, I'm out then. Screw that. I. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and your, your Star Trek uh, thing reminded me. So someone was talking about the Star Trek movie the other day, and I had to point out to them the craziness that, you know, they're running around in Iowa, and when Kirk almost drives off the cliff, I'm like, there's no cliffs in Iowa. Zero. So I made that same comment when that movie came out, and somebody followed me up with one word. Yet. <laughs> and I'm like, well, it does take place in the future, so you got I... me. But yeah, so, so those of you that aren't Iowans or uh, Captain Kirk fans – 
the town of Riverside, Iowa, which is eastern Iowa. <laughs> well, I forget. I'm in this new house. I can't remember which way is anything. Um, they have adopted themselves as the birthplace of, of James T. Kirk. And so it's a little town. It's like six, 700 people, something like that. And so they have all this stuff. And like 10 years ago, 15, uh, more than that, 15 years ago, Shatner filmed this, this, this bogus reality show called Invasion Iowa, where he basically went to Riverside and pretended like he was shooting this really crappy sci-fi thing, but really was just making fun of the rubes in Iowa. And uh, it was kind of funny, <laughs> I'll be honest. But yeah, so River, but, but it was cool because Riverside did this completely, you know, Gene Roddenberry didn't have anything to do with this. And the Star Trek folks were like, all right, fine, you can have it. And so they worked it into the canon. So yeah, that when they rebooted Star Trek here a few years ago, Kirk's from Iowa, Riverside, Iowa. Yeah, it was it was very sad, an unfortunate day, right? Because I think that gives Iowa some legitimacy. I, I'm not sure it gives it all the statehood thing that you want. But I think well, it again, some legitimacy. yet. So maybe by the time Kirk is born and, and they're chasing him, uh, the other thing, and this is a complete wild music nerd thing. Um, so if you remember that scene, he's got that old what motorcycle or whatever the hell it is, and the cops are chasing him because he's got you know, this illegal motorcycle thing, and he, he runs off and he loses them. There's a, a Rush song, Red Barchetta, that is that exact story about a kid who's got a car that runs on gas that's in a garage, and he takes it out for a joy ride, and the cops are chasing him because it's illegal, and he loses them, and it's all in the future. A uh, very fun story. So I'm watching that scene. I'm like, I've heard this song. I know how this ends. And I, I apologize to everyone. I caused this tangent about Iowa's facts. So I, I take the blame. You can hate me. Tom. They, al they already do, Shane. They already do. You have nothing to lose, buddy. Nothing at all. <laughs> hey, but good news is that brings us to topic number seven. We can't wait to talk about seven. Well, sorry, folks. We ran out of time. We're sitting at 30 minutes. It's been great. Uh, see you next. <laughs> no, go ahead, Shane. Tell them about number seven. All I can do is read it because I have no idea what it's about. But it looks like number seven is manage access. Good old Microsoft access at scale. Todd, how does that make you feel? Well, so it's manage access at scale for identity and things like that. Uh, not access the app, but access as in getting access to something. I said all I could do is read the words that were on the screen. You should write and, more words on the screen. And somehow you even screwed that up. No. Somehow. <laughs> I read the four words on the screen, manage access at scale. It was emphasis or emphasis or something. You, you, you <laughs> emphasize the, uh, the wrong word. So one of the things that I do as an IT pro, even though I'm a SharePoint guy and an Office 365 guy, is I read all the identity stuff, the, uh, the, the identity blogs and all that. And they had an article here a couple of weeks ago. This has been in the notes for a couple of weeks about how to manage identity access at scale. And it's using enterprise uh, mobility and things like that. And so it's a good little article about how to do syncing. It's, you know, Azure AD Connect, what things you can do with Azure AD Premium, those kind of things. And so I wanted to get that, uh, get that in the notes. And something I don't have in the notes, but I wish I did have in the notes, was with the new Azure AD Connect, which came out a week or two ago, they've got in preview now a thing called Azure AD pass-through authentication. And this is a crazy thing. I haven't had a chance to play with it uh, at scale yet, but it looks like it's like um, Azure AD Connect directory sync and ADFS. It looks like they kind of snuck back behind the barn uh, and, and did what teenagers do. And now we have pass-through authentication. So when you use pass-through authentication, you're not being authenticated against Office 365. So while your account does exist, you know, because of directory sync, so you can do security trimming and look it up in the gal and all that kind of stuff. When you authenticate, you're not being authenticated against Office 365. So in that regard, it's kind of like ADFS, but you don't have to install ADFS servers or maintain any of that infrastructure. So it's kind of like just Azure AD Connect. So what happens is they use the Azure AD proxy which is this ability that we've had for a while to publish things out to the internet. So you could publish central admin or whatever, you authenticate against Azure AD, it tunnels you in, but now they're tunneling in AD. So now when you try to log into Office 365, you don't authenticate against Office 365, you don't get pinged to ADFS, you put in your username and password, it does the proxy thing and authenticates you against your local AD, sends the token back and you get in. So pretty cool. All the, the benefits of ADFS, but without all the infrastructure and the complexity and all that. Um, so I haven't had a chance to play with that much. That is one of the things that I'm going to do this week while everybody else is on vacation, but I've already taken all my vacation. Uh, but, you know, everybody's gone, so nobody will know. That's one of the things I'm going to play with, but that, uh, that sounds pretty cool. 
It does. I mean, I, I think that the part where I saw my Microsoft Access and those tables and databases getting cool, cool it was more interesting. But since you brought it up, uh, it's okay. And as, and as I'm, as I'm talking about this very important identity thing, this revolutionary way to authenticate people, Daniel in the chat room is like, wake me when he stops talking. <sighs> I mean, you can drone on. Let's just call a spade a spade. You get on. You might put a quarter in there, and you're just like wah 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 wah. Somebody wah, pulled wah. my string, and it's uh. <laughs> All right. Um, and it reminds me of the song that I heard once. <laughs> is it about Iowa? Please let it be about Iowa. It's just not enough good songs about Iowa. Yeah, that uh -huh. or the college athletes who aren't playing anymore because they don't want to, you know, go play in their bowl game because they suck, right? Same there thing. you go. Let's let's bring it back to topic number five. That was part of that. We got to topic seven. Bring it back to number five. Tell us about uh, your your various musings and rants. Oh, my musings and rants, right? Well, that's one of them. Is I completely agree with the college kids that are like, hey, I'm not playing in your crappy bowl, so you can make a bunch of money. I need to go get ready for the NFL, and right, frankly, they don't want to get hurt. I totally don't blame the kids for not uh, playing. How do you feel? So which which uh, school is this? That's so this was USC. This was uh, Christian McCaffrey. Okay, because the, when I saw this, because all the all the notes in one note say, and I'm lucky they're in English because Shane went to school in Kentucky, but all it says is college athletes not playing in bowl games. I thought it was the Minnesota thing. Uh, so there in Minnesota, a bunch of football players are are uh, boycotting a bowl game because of some shenanigans with the administration there and people getting accused of things without. Uh, so basically the college kids, the football players think that some of their teammates were accused of something uh, falsely. And so to get the administration to say, hey, we screwed up. They're trying to, you know, boycott him with the bowl game. I thought that's what that note was about. No, but I mean, the Minnesota guys, they they gave up there or not gave up, but they their demands were met. So they're back to they're going to play. Um, Interesting. Yeah, and I was also supposed to point out apparently USC and Stanford are two different colleges. So McCaffrey plays for Stanford apparently. Is it? Has that always been the case? Have they always been two different places? I don't. I, know. I, don't, I don't know. I'm. I'm gonna have to fact check that. I. I don't believe because because the people in the chat room that are, that are spewing this nonsense about USC and Stanford being two different teams kind of suspect. I don't know. Yeah. Well, Stanford's the one, right? They're the Cardinals, but their mascot's a tree. It's very awkward with those people. Uh, so Iowa State, our mascot is the Cyclone, or our team is a Cyclone, but our mascot's a Cardinal. So maybe you guys should get together and see if you can work out something there. Go go back behind the barn, go back behind the shed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, two parents love each other is very much. Is that what you're suggesting? Mm -hmm. uh, our good friend Super Mario Run came out this week. I've installed it on my phone. I have not played it yet. Uh, how, so how exciting. does that feel? I have to know, Shane, how does that feel after 10 years when you see a game or an app show up in the news, mm -hmm. you just go to your phone and you install it. How does that feel? Well, good news is Apple had spammed me 17 times already to install it, so I didn't even have to see it in the news. They 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 shoved it down upon me, kind of like that YouTube album. They're like, it's on your machine. Take it. Did that make the right reference there? I I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, now, I am on Android, so I it's funny because that, that Mario Run is only for iPhone. And so I was not able to follow the herd and get that. But some developer was kind enough to make a knockoff of it for Android called Super Plumber Run. <laughs> so it's, it's apparently the same game, but it's Super Plumber Run. And it probably uh, doesn't cost $10, right? It, it costs $0 as far as I can tell. Now, uh, you, as far as I know, Shane, you have watched me play a video game exactly one time in your life. And it resulted in me nearly dying in the emergency room and blood all over your house. So I don't need to convince you how bad I am at video games, but I am bad at video games. So I played Super Plumber Run for about 37 seconds and, uh, you know, fell in a hole or something. <clears throat> yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad that you, well, I don't know if I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> I can prove, and I know that you're successful in playing this time without hurting yourself. Uh, whether or not I'm glad you're here is probably a different story. Still have um, a use of all my fingers. But, and we won that game that I nearly died. That's the important part. Our record stands. We are undefeated. Yes, we showed our athletic prowess, right? Is it is this? Is that how you fly? I, <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, and I think it's just interesting because people, a lot of people were upset that it cost $10. And, you know, one of the developers tweeted, well, you know, the first version that you guys bought back for your Nintendo cost $50, which is like $94 today. So, you know, people's expectations that all these games should be 99 cents or less blows their mind. They have to pay $10. But, you know, they, they struggle with not understanding where things come from, right? I mean, Super yeah. Mario Brothers 
can't exist at 99 cents a pop. They, 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 the budget's not there for a corporation like that to make a high quality game. So the people who don't want to pay for it are also the ones that complain it doesn't have the features they want. It's like, well, you know, go spend the money and then you can complain because now they've got the resources to develop and make a better game. And I, I think at some point it's going to come to a head with the world that, you know, this whole idea that everything should be free, but everything should be exactly what I want. Those two don't work together very well. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you. And and I've had the discussion. I've got a, a few friends that just out of principle and whatever principle that is, I don't understand, won't pay for games on their phone. And, and I'm like, well, you, you understand, like there's a, there's a guy in his basement or, or there's a company that's, re, that's investing resources to write that thing. And it's not like they're some nefarious multinational corporation that's poisoning the waters. You know, are you getting 99 cents worth of entertainment out of it? Then throw them the buck. I mean, it's not, um, you know, so yeah. I don't know. I, I bought a bunch of games over the years and I would continue to do it. Well, and that's like so. One of the games that I play now that I have a phone that can play them is uh, there's a Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, right? It's I don't know. I'm a Star Wars nerd. I like the yeah. game. It's free though. You can play completely free. It's all there. Uh, but you know, you can pay X dollars to get crystals and things like that. And so while I'm not the the whales of the world who spend hundreds and thousands of dollars a month, there are people that spend a thousand dollars a month or more on this game. Good lord. Um, I know. But I mean, I feel obligated every month. To, you know, buy a dollar worth of stuff just to like, you know, keep feeding. Like, Hey, I want new content. I want the game to continue to get better. I'm voting with my dollars and the people that are, they wear these hats. Like I'm free to play. I've never spent a dollar. Yay me, but it should have these seven features. I'm like, you ain't getting this. You, you, you want the features, go buy a hundred dollar pack of crystals and then go tell them you want the features. Yeah. And I don't know if it's uh, because I'm just a better person than all these other people that could be it. Uh, or, I mean, I've worked at a software company and I, and I, I've been on both sides of that equation and I've heard the complaints and, and seen the piracy and all that. Uh, but yeah, I'm with you. you. You know, if you don't want to pay the 10 bucks, don't pay the 10 bucks, but don't be mad at them for trying to, you know, make a profit and employ people. And I, just, I don't understand it. Yeah. All right. We probably should wrap up. I uh, hear. Well, let, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about Rogue One. We've both seen it. Uh, ah. So so no spoilers. So if you, for those of you that are listening, don't worry. We're not going to spoil Rogue One, even though every single person on the planet knows how it ends because we've seen the first Star Wars movie. We, we know, it's like Titanic. It's like Apollo 13. We all know how it ends, but, but no specific spoilers. Uh, what did you think? I loved it. I thought it was a great movie. Um, so my wife and I went uh, for our 10th anniversary, we went to like a 10 o'clock show. You romantic devil, you. I know. And <laughs> she didn't hate it. She has never watched a Star Wars movie. That's the first one she's ever watched. Really? Yeah, she's not a fan. But she did not hate it. Um, no, and it's it's just a typical, it's a war movie, right? It's a science fiction war movie. And it's good and yay. The one thing I will say, though, is at the end, the the the, the way they slammed it up against episode four, or yeah yeah episode four uh, that that was like the most amazing thing i've think i've ever seen in a movie in my entire life that was just like oh my god you literally just yeah just chills went through the spine of every person in the theater simultaneously yeah uh, I, I i will agree the way they the way they tied that out was and, and I'll, I'll be honest it's the way that i expected they would do it it's the way that i knew they had to do it and then when they did it it's still just yes i agree um, but I don't want to give too much away. So one of the things I was, I was amazed by many things, the, the story, if you go out and look, they, they rewrote the story a bunch of times and they rewrote the ending a bunch of times. So if you go back and watch the previews, you'll notice the ending doesn't happen the same way. Um, and that's, that's interesting once you see the differences. Um, but what I loved was how well they stuck to the aesthetics of the seventies technology. So again, this takes place before the first Star Wars movie that came out in 77. And so while the special effects were revolutionary, they're 40 years old at this point. So what I loved, the first three, when they redid episodes one, or when they did episodes one, two, and three, the technology seemed too shiny to exist before episode four, the first Star Wars movie. One of the things that that grabbed me about Rogue One was how well they maintained the aesthetic of the technology of the first movie without it looking dated and without I don't know. I just thought that everything fit well. I had no problems imagining that that story took place before the next movie. Um, they did some amazing things with Peter Cushing's uh, character. I think we cannot. I think it doesn't spoil anything if we talk about that. 
Yeah, and see, that's right. Get because I also want to mention the old film that they snuck in there, right? With the the so did maybe you haven't read that article? The um, don't spoil anything. Yeah, so I'll tell you later. But yeah, so they spliced in some unseen footage from the original. Um, I think it was from Empire Strikes Back. They took some footage out of that and spliced it in this movie, and you don't even. Unless you think about it, you don't realize it because it just looks like it belonged. Yeah. Back to your whole, they got the aesthetic right the whole way through. Yeah, just just an amazing job. So uh, again, no spoilers, but in episode five, Empire Strikes Back, there's a character, Grand Moff Tarkin, who was portrayed by Peter Cushing, very well-known actor. He died in 1994. His character shows up in this movie. He's been dead, like I said, 23 years, uh, and that gets him a pass on this movie. He doesn't have to be in this movie. They did an amazing job. Uh, they did some CGI. They had an actor portray his part. And if you look at the actor, if you go find him, his name's Guy Henry or something like that. He physically looks like Peter Cushing. He's got the same body type, same kind of gaunt face. Uh, but then they ended up CGIing Peter Cushing's face over top of him. And it was really well done. It was, and, and, I, and the thing about it that I was most impressed with was... That character in episode five is an important character in the whole infrastructure of the of the Imperial uh, folks. So he, he kind of had to show up, but they could have uh, they could have punted on it. They could have had him like walk through and say, uh, hey, John, you're in charge. I'm going to go uh, and, and just kind of made a passing thing. But they did not shy away from it. He was a prominent character in the movie. All the CGI stuff that they did um, was up front and. And it was just not distracting. So there's a, a a phenomenon called the uncanny valley. Have you uh, experienced the uncanny valley? So the uncanny valley is this thing where um, CGI humans are believable as they get better. And then right before they become really realistic, they drop and they become super creepy. And that's the uncanny valley. So if you will, like watch the movie Polar Express, the cartoon with Tom Hanks, you see the humans in there. They just look creepy. They just look weird. That's the uncanny valley. And so when you do these kind of things, you run that risk of turning people off because you hit that uncanny valley. They did not do that with this. And I was just amazed at how well it worked. Um, ILM did it again. It was, it was amazing. And the storytelling was good. And I liked it. It, it was. I, yeah, we should talk about this again next week because it is way late. I'm about to get in Sorry. trouble. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, we will, maybe we'll have a special Star Wars episode with spoilers. Uh, well, because we talked like, about next week, we were just going to ramble, right? No, no real news. <laughs> so there maybe you there you go. We do that. All right. So promotion of uh, the very first thing, the most important thing is my birthday drive is going full bore right now. You can go to pointgowan.com slash TK charity and donate. So again, my birthday is next month. You still have a few days to save up and buy me that perfect birthday present. But while you're doing that, consider giving some money to your favorite charity. Whatever your charity of choice is, give some money to it. Register at uh, pointgowan.com. That's Lori's uh, website slash TK charity. And what we do is we just kind of gather it all together to see how much money all of you podcast listeners uh, donate. We've already got, so we started this, uh, really hit it hard last week, over $1,000. Uh, so far. And like last year, last year I matched the money. I think I might do that again this year. We'll see how well you guys do. Uh, but last year I matched the money. So all the money that you guys donate and gets registered at uh, pointgowan.com slash TK charity. I'll see about matching to some charities of my own, uh, my own choosing, but I don't care what you donate to. It's not me trying to get money for the, uh, you know, widows and orphans fund at Todd Clint's house, whatever's uh, big for you. What do you got going on, Shane? Well, first off, I want to know why you don't jump into a big bowl like uh, Ezekiel Elliott last night, right? The whole Salvation Army thing. Apparently, their donations are up 180% or something from him doing it. So maybe if you would throw yourself in a red bowl, you'd be able to do the same thing for your show. Uh, I, I'm open to suggestions, I guess. You know, I've been working out. If I need to throw on a Speedo and do something, uh, you know. There's a different story about that I'll tell you tomorrow. All right. Um, <laughs> So, but speaking of charity, uh, the last thing I got here is my SharePoint Power Shell class. Well, I'm teaching it tomorrow, probably a little late because this won't be out until not Sometime tomorrow. in February, yeah. Uh, but I'm also teaching again in January. So if you'd like to donate to the Shane Young charity, um, come take uh, my beginning Power Shell class. Lots of fun. Or just send those pesky people who don't bother you with, will you do it for me stuff? I'll yep, teach them for you. 
And uh, for those of you on the audio only stream, go to boldzebras.com slash PowerShell training, all one word for that. So Shane, get out of here, do your coaching things. Chat room, I'll stick around for a bit because I love you more than Shane does. Thanks, everybody. Um, have a Merry Christmas. You will not uh, hear from me before Christmas. And uh, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays, whatever you celebrate, celebrate it well. Have fun, and we will see you next week. Toodles. Bye.